On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of CEO Kaito, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China. We are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And uh, with that introduction, I would like to hand over this podium to our first speaker, Professor Jan Kalpakhat. Thank you so much um, for the introduction and for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, vascular, neurovascular cases um, we're currently doing um, here at the Hospital of the um, of, um, University of Pennsylvania here in Philadelphia in the U.S. And due to a setup change over the last couple of years, we have now the opportunity to really do a lot of hybrid OR cases. And I want to highlight these cases today in my presentation. These are my disclosures. Um, so first of all, I want to talk a little bit about our setup, what we have here um, in Philadelphia. And then I want to talk a little bit about um, biplane and 3D interoperative angiogram as an adjunct for open vascular surgery. And then um, I want to highlight some hybrid procedures and who are planned, and then also some unplanned procedures, because it gives you the opportunity while you do an open case, also to switch to endovascular or vice versa from endovascular to open. So our setup here um, on the left side, you see our old hospital. Um, and in October 2021, we moved to a new hospital, the Pavilion, um, as you can see here, where we do now all our inpatient procedures. And before we moved, we had a really separate setup for endovascular procedures and open procedures in the OR. You can see we had biplane rooms in the radiology space plus, an, plus regular ORs. And if you needed an angiography during surgery, we would use a C-arm. Then in October 2016, still in the old hospital, we acquired an, a hybrid room where we then planned on doing most of the vascular, open vascular procedures in that room to have the opportunity to do a, um, an angiography intraoperatively. And then since we moved now to the new hospital, we actually have now um, only hybrid OR rooms. So we have three biplane um, angio suites who are embedded in the OR. So now we don't even have any rooms in radiology. So we do all our pure endovascular diagnostic angios all in the setup, plus all the open cases. So it kind of changed our complete setup. And so this is kind of the overview on the left side, you can see the room, which is close to an, also an interoperative three Tesla MRI. And on the right side, you see um, mirrored two biplane rooms, as you can see here. So overall, we have three rooms. The ones on the right were more dedicated for purely endovascular cases, but we can switch to open as needed. And the left one is mainly dedicated for open cases, but we can also switch vice versa, or it's an overflow in case we have a thrombectomy to do it in that room. So overall three rooms, as you can see here, modern 3D um, and um, biplane capacity. So just in as, as an example, so what does that mean in, in our modern um, era? So if a ruptured aneurysm comes into our hospital, these patients get in one of these rooms, um, and then first get a diagnostic angiogram. And based on that, we can decide if we treat endovascular or try endovascular and then switch to open or vice versa. So just in general, if, if I see a secular aneurysm with a narrow neck, they usually get coiled when they're ruptured, they're wide necked, um, depending on how the shapes of the aneurysm may still be coiled or intrasecular devices or clipped, depending how the aneurysm morphology looks like. And then obviously for other more challenging aneurysms, fusiform or others, um, you can, you can and decide on more complex treatment options. And obviously, if there's an ICH or mass effect or multiple aneurysms, you change your strategy depending on, on the patient um, individually. Um, and the nice thing is, whatever you decide, you can do an intraoperative 3D um, uh, angiography and biplane angiography. So you all, you know for sure that the aneurysm is treated before the patient is so OR. So it's a really one shop, um, stop, stop shop. So, um, so that um, um, leads me to my first part of the presentation about like what is the adjunct for biplane 3D interoperative angiography. So since we have it now in our setup, um, I use it for every vascular case because it's very easy and our workflow is embedded for um, biplane angiography during open surgeries. And here I wanna highlight a few cases where it's really, less, um, really useful. So in this patient, a 56 year old patient with a ruptured small Lister like ACOM aneurysm, you can see it's projecting posterior um, and it's very small, so kind of hidden in the bifoc and in the um, anterior communicating artery. Um, here in these cases, when they're ruptured, um, I, here I decided to do open, 
But in ruptured cases, when I do open microsurgical clipping, I usually go from the dominant A1, as you can see here from the left side. And then in the standard um, technique, first um, opening um, widely directed space, you can see here over the internal coronal artery, and then finding the ICA terminus and then following the A1 segment to really expose the A1. And then to communicating um, area. And you can see, um, you can see some subarachnoid blood here, but it's really challenging to really see the aneurysm, which is on the back wall. So here in this case, I decided to do a fenestrated clip um, behind um, that ACOM complex to really reach that small aneurysm. Um, that's intra with 2D angiography, and you can see that you don't really see much here, right? So also IC green doesn't help you because it's in the back, it's hidden. So here really the 3D interruptive angiogram where you can do reconstructions from the front and back can really help you to, to make sure you, you got the aneurysm and the patient as well. These are just like examples of our setup. So this is the 3D spin intraoperatively. You can see um, we drape the patient and then we perform our spin either with a single plane or with the icono. As you can see here, you can do that also with biplane um, without removing the, the lateral plane. Um, another similar case, so that was a patient was referred to me for open clipping um, for failed attempt of endovascular calling in an outside hospital. Here, similar scenario, dissection from the left side. Um, here in this case, I tried to do a curved clip to reach the aneurysm in the back. And you can see here how useful the interoperative angiogram was, both 2D and 3D showed that there is like um, a residual of the aneurysm. So I went back in and readjusted the clip more um, more steeper angle in addition to a second clip. And then the interoperative second uh, 3D angiogram um, showed complete occlusion. And that was the follow-up after one year. It's also useful for AVM resections. Obviously for all AVM resections, I use interoperative angiogram to confirm complete resection of the nidus. This is an interesting case also referred from an outside hospital um, with resection in an outside hospital and now rebleed in the cavity. Um, it is, um, that was the angiogram initially, and you can see, um, you can't really see a residual here on the zoomed out pictures. You can see that the ACA um, is still pretty dominant here, so that's kind of suspicious. And if you look closer at microcatheter runs, you can see that there is a little bit of a residual nidus, but not a draining vein, which is probably because of the hemorrhage compressing that vein. Um, so using Dyna CT, micro Dyna CT in this new setup can really highlight where the nidus is and in relationship to to this a previous surgical field, and you can actually use that for planning, and you can use that dynasty you acquire in your hybrid room for navigation, and really locate um, where the residual um, or recurrent AVM is here in this case, probably residual here hidden under that vein, um, dissecting out, confirming with fluorescein, and then resecting that residual nidus, and these are the post-op scans with complete resection, and also post-op dynas, micro dynas CT confirms also the nidus resection. Um, I use it also for bypass surgery. I mean, it's not necessary to do an intraoperative angiogram for, for direct bypasses. Indirect anyways, you don't need to do this. But since we have the setup and I, I really, really like to, to get more information currently for my cases and, and also to see it because if you do a bypass, you do an IC green, you only see the surface. But I'm also interested in are these bypasses really filling the whole MCA territory back in? And do I see any other complications? Do I need, um, based on these information, do I want to have another bypass performed? So this is an, a case here, also in the hybrid room. You can see that standard STA, MCA. I usually dissect both branches out, one for an indirect and one for a direct bypass. It's a combined um, approach. You can see the direct bypass performed. Um, and then after that here, this is just highlighting a technique which I started doing. Um, using an implant, which allows you intraoperatively and postoperatively um, flow assessment of the bypass through a um, translucent implant um, made of PMMA. And we recently published a larger study on this, which also allows you IC green and fluorescein um, imaging through that device. But if you look at the 3D angiogram and 2D angiogram here, you can really intraoperatively, you can see that, that this one... Um, single um, STA MCA branch really fills into the MCA and fills both uh, frontal and temporal MCA. So that was enough to do just one bypass. If I see just a focal trap area, then I use the other branch also for possible um, second, second bypass. Here you can see this highlight and also the 3D angiogram shows you like how big was your anastomosis side and can really zoom in. So it gives you more information um, 
in addition to your usual setup. Also, our setup um, allows us to do go very low with the with a single plane. As you can see here, you, then, uh, things are possible. For example, transpopliteal angiography for um, for patients who who um, um, who undergo like dura ev fistula resection, for example, um, in in the operative room instead of taping a, a catheter from the femoral in first um, supine position and then after switching to prone position to, to tape it on the side, you can go direct access to the transport route. All right, so let me talk a little bit now about the hybrid procedures. First about like planned procedures. Um, so what is the definition of a hybrid procedure? So for me, it's really a procedure where you from the beginning plan that you use both open microsurgical techniques as well as endovascular techniques to complete the treatment for the patient. And there are multiple different options for different diseases. So here are a few examples for aneurysms, for example, where you combine clipping with, um, um, with balloon occlusion for temporary clipping or bypass and vessel sacrifice, or also ICH evacuation and coiling. For dura AV fistulas, obviously um, it's a rare scenario because mainly it's um, transarterial transvenous embolization for these fistulas or microsurgical clipping, but there are sometimes um, combined procedures, for example, access of, a, of a, a fistula pouch for endovascular treatment. And then also AVM, so other diseases, you can think about hybrid procedures. Um, the most common um, or one of the most common nowadays and in the US, we started doing middle meningeal artery embolization for chronic subdural hematomas. And it's, um, it's a nice technique to combine this in case the patient also needs evacuation. So you can do that in the same setting. So this is an example of an old patient, 75 years old, with left-sided weakness and had recurrent subdural hematoma after burr holes three months ago with mass effect and symptomatic. So here in this case, we planned embolization here, transradial approach for MMA embolization, as well as um, re-evacuation of the hematoma. We decided also to do burr holes since it's uh, not a lot of membranes and it looked like it's feasible to, to evacuate it again with burr holes. So it's just a transradial MMA embolization approach with six fan short sheaths and a guide catheter and a microcatheter positioned in the MMA. Here you can see the old burr holes and the selective M MMA um, injection. I um, we, we enroll in, in trials too. So it depends kind of, we have three ongoing trials in the US. So either um, um, liquid embolics or um, different liquid embolics um, or glue um, are options or particles here. In this case, I use particles and coils to occlude that vessel first penetrate um, the, um, the middle meningeal artery with particles and then coiled off the two branches, as you can see here. In this scenario, it was a little bit easier because the patient was blind on that side um, of the eye, so there is less risk for um, for blindness in this in this specific case. And then followed um, by uh, reopening with burr holes. Here, I just want to highlight, so the nice thing about this is I can do an intra CT scan. Here, it's called like this uh, SIN spin, uh, CT spin for um, Siemens, and um, which, which is... Um, similar to a CT scan um, and allows you to, to really um, look intraoperatively, for example, position of your drain, here is subdural drain, and if you evacuated the, the hematoma well, I mean, it's not necessary, but since you have it and it's, it's a quick setup, I, I usually use that here and you can see also the positioning. Um, other options for hybrid treatments are dura AV fistulas. Here are a few publications highlighted by my previous partner, um, Peter Kahn from, from Baylor. Um, where there are creative approaches to really get like very difficult um, dura AV fistulas here, examples of CC fistulas um, combined with either robotic puncture or transphenoidal approaches. I wanna highlight a quick case, which was just published actually today in um, JNIS. Um, it's a 63 year old patient who um, has a pretty complex dura AV fistula. As you can see here, he presented with a small hemorrhage and, and venous hypertension on the scans. And interestingly, the patient had like, based on an MRI, um, occlusion of the superior sagittal sinus. Um, and he presented to our ER um, a couple of months before where the sinus was open. So this was like um, within six weeks, the sinus occluded. Um, and based on the angiogram, you can now see how complex that fistula is. There's bilateral MMA, STA, occipital artery, as well as additional vessels feeding into that common pouch in the superior sagittal sinus. 
So, um, and if you look at the drainage of the dura ivy fistula, it's using the superior sagittal sinus. And since the sinus is occluded posterior, it just drains anterior and uses all the cortical veins to drain, which caused his symptoms as anestic deficits, as well as venous hypertension. If you look at the brain, this is a selective internal run. You can see that um, the brain actually is not using that sinus portion. It's actually draining back to the labae and deep venous system. So this is really a segment which is not needed by um, the anterior portion of the superior sagittal sinus, not needed by, um, by the brain um, and just is drained by, um, by, the, by the fistula. You can see that the, the dyna CT, which highlights us and helps us to plan the procedure. So here, since um, there were multiple arterial feeders and it was really challenging due to the occlusion of the sinus to reach transvenous, we decided to do kind of a combined approach to do a surgical approach to the sinus and then puncture and then um, coil occlusion of that common pouch in the sinus. So again, in our um, hybrid OR, you can use actually just the snap uh, clamp to, to localize on, on the roadmap, which we acquired through a uh, transradial diagnostic angiography um, where the sinus is located. And then here you can place a burr hole, extend the burr hole a little bit to then um, access the sinus by puncture with the radial sheath. And then this is the setup. So through the sheath, you can bring, um, here you can quickly see the, the burr hole and the inserting of the sheath and the, um, uh, and the roadmap. And then after the, the sheath is placed, you can, you can actually bring in a microcatheter, as you can see here over a wire, into that, into that pouch pretty easily. And then from there, you can start coiling um, that pouch. Um, very focused coiling here in that area. And then it didn't really need a lot of coils to really take down this, um, this fistula. As you can see here in the control runs, you can, you can see that it's already um, occluded and stasis within the arterial feeders. And that was also confirmed then on post-procedure um, post and geography on both sides. You can see that all these external vessels are now really slow flow and you can see a complete occlusion of the fistula by this approach. And enclosure was just with gel foam and, um, and a titanium plate, as you can see here. Patient significantly improved right after surgery and is doing um, still well on, on long-term follow-up. Another rare case I want to highlight for a hybrid procedure is this patient, um, super rare scenario, um, but I just wanted to show you um, what, what our out-of-the-box thinking was in this young patient who had a basilar um, stroke mainly cerebellar strokes. So the patient came into our hospital um, needing um, a decompressive hemicraniectomy and a suboccipital um, craniectomy rather. Um, but in addition to, um, to his swelling, he also had a subocclusive clot um, in, the, um, in the basilar tip. So our, our thinking was um, if we do a um, decompression and the patient needs to be on heparin because of the subocclusive clot, clot in the basilar, um, that's not a good scenario. So but together, we all will all discuss our stroke patients with our neurology stroke team. And so they were in favor that we do first a thrombectomy of that subocclusive clot um, that the patient doesn't require heparin after surgery and then, and then uh, continue with uh, decompression of the posterior fossa. So, and since, um, since this patient was, was fairly big, um, and we, we were anyways in the same room where we would do the thrombectomy, I decided to quickly do everything in one. So, so what we did is in prone position and, and supine position, as you can see here, I placed the left radial sheet because the left radial uh, left vertebral artery was dominant to the basilar. And then um, we positioned him in prone on our biplane table. So now the left arm was on the side where we would do our angiography. Um, it's more um, comfortable. And in addition, it was the uh, the dominant vertebral artery. And now you can see a thrombectomy in prone position through the left radial artery going up into the left um, vertebral artery. You can see the subocclusive clot on the basilar tip and um, retrieving that with a uh, stent retriever and aspiration. And then since we were in position, we were just um, then repositioning the head a little bit, but um, we were already pinned. And then we can do the decompression here and interoperatively, we can also, similar to what I showed you before for the subdural hematoma um, evacuation, you can do a CT scan, you can see the extent of your decompression, and you can also do a CT scan to make sure you, you have good compression of decompression of your posterior fossa. Um, another more common procedure maybe is 
aneurysm hyperprocedures. So here, this is a proximal periclinoid aneurysm. Pretty challenging to, to clip right away. Obviously, it can be done. Um, but a large hemorrhage with mass effect, um, pretty urgent um, procedure. So we went right away into the OR. And here in the first step, um, I decided to first um, do a large craniotomy to give space and then see if I can quickly call that aneurysm. So first DHC, then coiling of the aneurysm, which was very fast and, and, and went really well. And then after that, evacuating of the clot. And, and then um, here in this case, we actually could um, put the bone back in. We didn't leave it out. So, um, and that was the six month follow-up angiogram. So a, a fairly good result for this, um, for this pretty challenging um, case presenting with, with rupture and progressive decline. Um, but there are also some other options for, for unplanned procedures um, where we would con convert from open to endovascular or endovascular to, to open. Um, and you can imagine, for example, if you have an incomplete coiling, you start with coiling and that doesn't work out, you can switch to clipping or other scenarios you can think about like failed thrombectomy and you want to do an emergency bypass, for example, or, or other scenarios. So here are a few examples. So this is what I mentioned. This is a patient, 58-year-old um, patient looks first, if you look at the scan, like, oh yeah, I think I can call that aneurysm. But if you look close at the 3D, you can see it's really wide neck and there's an additional blep, so pretty challenging. Um, since I was in the op interoperative setting anyways and planned for like clipping in case it doesn't work, I didn't want to drop a stent here because the hemorrhage was really extensive, young patient. So I started to coil first call was deployed, but then I really lost access with my microcatheter, even with the balloon cyst here, I wasn't able to get back in um, safely to, to deploy another coil. So here in this scenario, I, I decided to switch to open. Um, that was my final coiling result, obviously not sufficient to secure that aneurysm. So I exposed it um, similar to the cases I showed before, also from the left side here, as you can see here. And what is interesting is, um, so this was just coiled a few minutes ago before we opened, and you can see already the coils in the space. So it is actually really um, that was definitely the rupture site where the, the site where the uh, where the coil was placed, and you can see that the coils are really in the subarachnoid space sometimes. Um, so, but but that kind of helped us to protect the dome in the end, and then under temporary clipping was able to to clip that aneurysm. Um, combined with the wide neck, as you can see here, these are the intraoperative angiograms and also the follow up. The patient did well. Um, another um, case conversion from endovascular to open, I want to highlight from my partner, Dr. Vesish Srinivasan, um, one of my team um, um, partners, also dual um, trained open and endovascular neurosurgeons. Um, it's an it's a older patient um, with an NIHSS of seven, uh, presented with an M MCA occlusion, but also with an acute left carotid occlusion, as you can see here. And he, he attempted multiple times to recross and open that, that lesion in the neck, but was not successful with different techniques, different catheters. So here he switched over to a CEA acutely in that setting. Um, and you can see here, this is the CEA setup in our hybrid suite. So um, there's not a lot of work needed to just um, open the neck as needed. And uh, here he decided to, after he closed the CEA to do direct puncture, since the neck was open for the thrombectomy procedure, um, other options would have been you go back to, to the groin or, or arm where you did, where you started your procedure, or you leave kind of the, the suture line open and do the thrombectomy through this. But I think that's a very elegant, um, way to do it. And so here in the first, first step, he did, um, aspiration to reopen the carotid and then a few other additional steps with aspiration. And then also with a small stent retriever to really get a good, um, TK3 result here for this patient and then closure of the carotid. Um, let me highlight a few other scenarios where you do first microsurgical treatment and then you switch to endovascular during the procedure. This is also a case by Dr. Srinivasan, as you can see here, also high-grade um, ACOM aneurysm rupture, um, initially treated with a great coiling result, as you can see here, balloon-assisted, but we always do um, one to two week follow-up angiograms for our rupture case to make sure, um, especially for endovascular treated patients, um, to make sure it's um, it's still completely occluded. And here you can see an early recurrency of the aneurysm 10 days later, um, a reattempt of recoiling failed. So he decided to clip that aneurysm. In that scenario, you can see the approach from the right side, um, terional craniotomy splitting the fissure and coming along the, the right A1 
exposing that aneurysm. You can see here is really a large, large um, new recurrence. You can see some of the coils, but it's it's um, it's definitely uh, grew back the aneurysm. And here is his clipping result. Um, look great on IC green, but then on the intraoperative angiogram, you can see that all of a sudden the A1 here stops. And so um, during the clipping process, um, a clot formed here. So, and then although the IC green looked okay because the contralateral side was filling the ACAs, um, you, you wouldn't have picked that up if you don't have an angiogram. And here um, he did then uh, switched quickly to a direct aspiration thrombectomy and reopened the ACA in this scenario. Another option is, for example, bypass surgery. As I mentioned, I use that intraoperative angiogram for my bypasses. Here, this is a patient who had a previous bypass on the left side with a good result, but now progression on the right side as well. So needed um, a bypass on this side. Here again, my standard approach, direct indirect combination bypass. You, you can see here that the direct bypass performed. Um, and I see green, um, Floyd 100 looked great right after the procedure. Um, but if you look now at the three, um, the, the 2D angiogram, um, intraoperatively, you can see there is a lot of like spasm of the vessel proximally, and it's not really filling a lot, although the IC green looked very uh, convincing. So here, um, in this scenario, I was able to just infuse verapamil to increase the flow of the vessel and then also papaverin in the open space because the, the head was still open to, to really make the vessel back, back to a normal shape. Um, other options, which we published before, is, for example, to increase the flow by angioplasty. And in this case, where um, the ECA is pretty narrow, and in, instead of going with a high-flow bypass, just increasing the flow of your STA MCA bypass by increasing um, the size of the vessel of the ECA, or in this case, by um, my former partner, uh, Peter Kahn, um, in case of a dissection. This is a case um, was performed in the pediatric hospital where they called us that there was an um, occlusion of um, the STA after the bypass and there was a dissection, probably happened during the, the dissection of the case and, and, and the stenting uh, reopened the vessel and then as the most side was open. So there are, um, even for bypass uh, surgery, a few options where you can combine procedures. And that's kind of what I um, prepared for today. And so in summary, I want to say that um, really the transition to a biplane hybrid OR opens new opportunities and gives you more information you even you didn't even think about before. And um, these new information obviously make you make new decisions and um, and to act in case you see something which you haven't seen before. Um, so for me, it's really, um, it's a nice way. It's a one-stop shop for cerebrovascular cases. And me and my partners here, we're all doing intraoperative angiograms um, for all our um, open vascular cases. And I think it really adds information and makes the procedure safer for the patient. Um, and as I highlighted here, we have different possible scenarios. Either we just do endovascular only, or we do open only, but with intraoperative angiogram or planned hybrid procedures um, or unplanned hybrid um, procedure um, bailouts, either for open or endovascular. So I want to thank you again for having me today. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a really wonderful lecture and uh, it was very informative. Uh, if I will start with the uh, questions for myself, uh, having you, you showed the endovascular bailout of a open surgery and open surgery bailout of an endovascular procedure. So these are like kind of uh, unplanned uh, transitions to open from endovascular. So how difficult is the reversal of patient from the heparin? Like because it is uh, an uh, you convert it in an emergency situation. Okay. So uh, how good is the reversal? What do you ha had you had any complications that you have uh, had an intracerebral hematoma and you had to go in later and intervene? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so we didn't have any complications. Um, obviously, we would reverse if, if we are happen fully heparinized for a patient with protamine. But for example, for the angiograms, we usually place a sheath early on, like before. So for, for open cases, when I go, uh, place a femoral sheath, I usually connect that with anesthesia for the A-line. So there's no heparin going into the sheath. And the same also for the, for the radial sheath. Um, sometimes I even do for, for open cases, for the bypasses, I, I have it just on like a normal sailing drip. Um, I, I didn't see any complications of that. But obviously, if you're fully heparinized, then you need to reverse before you switch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Professor Mathuria has joined us. Professor Mathuria, uh, you may ask your question. 
it's an excellent talk and particularly i am impressed with your uh, technique of uh, doing the thrombectomy in the basilar and doing the craniotomy at the same time it's a fabulous thing which you have described really impressed say the uh, i don't have uh, much experience about the hybrid things and the hybrid things in the anything other than the aneurysms we started doing this right uh, say just on the cm when we used to operate on the aneurysms of carotid ophthalmic and we had a cm at that time and we have open, put the temp, say the we have opened the neck and then from there we were uh, doing the retrograde decompression at the same time we did the angiogram with that and saw that the aneurysm is clipped properly or not the question is that if there is a basilar top aneurysm and if there is a carotid ophthalmic aneurysm in which you want to clip is it possible that you place the catheter and a balloon in the basilar or in the uh, carotid artery for the basilar top or the carotid ophthalmic respectively and then if when the temporary clip is required you just inflate the balloon and you go ahead yeah exactly that's that's a yeah the, so so it is possible and it's well described in the literature um uh, you really do it do, do you do it and what is your experience on that yeah so we rarely do it because um i'm a little bit worried having the balloon the whole procedure in the vessel because it can form thrombus and and then you would need heparin so i mean mm -hmm. um i went away from this but like there are um papers published about this um it's 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 effective it's definitely working but um you just have to think about like that that the balloon is kind of um a challenge because it floats in there another option is to use um, a balloon guide catheter and and stay pretty low in the common carotid for example or internal carotid in the neck and then just inflate from there instead of having a um a micro catheter balloon higher up um floating more close to in intracranially but um yeah but that's 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 the classic i think hybrid uh, procedure actually it's, uh, since you are, you are you are with this facility that's why one advise see the thing is in the carotid ophthalmic aneurysm it is only the thing that we are opening the neck and there we are not opening the neck if we are putting the balloon so it doesn't yeah. involve much of the procedural problems but if there is a basilar top aneurysm and you are putting the temporary clip repeatedly on the basilar it becomes a problem to going to the proximal basilar and putting the clip repeatedly whereas if you have put a balloon in the basilar probably you can repeatedly inflate and deflate yeah there if correct. it is uh, uh, because there if you are able, you, know, you can uh, since, since you have got a fabulous setup you can explore this thing and if we can achieve this it is going to reduce your uh, say the uh, to be very frank the mental tension at the time when you are repeatedly putting a temporary clip on the basilar plus it will be very safe you can repeatedly do it and you can do it for a shorter while even 2 minutes 4 minutes uh, otherwise you will think that i utilize whole 5 minutes once i have put a time temporary clip in the basilar intracranially i think you will agree with me on that Yes, that's a very good comment. And the other uh, thing is that uh, uh, can I go ahead, uh, Doctor Raja? Please, please. Uh, other thing is that uh, say in olden days that if there is a wide neck aneurysm, the uh, endovascular people say that they are unable to coil. We say that the other side of the neck I am unable to see, and if there is a crucial circulation on the other side, I can't put a clip properly to occlude the neck. he cannot coil it because it is a wide neck so what we can do is that we put a clip the other side of the neck which is not seen i don't clip reduce the size of the neck and do the endovascular uh, coiling of that area so if it is a ruptured case still we will not have to give any antiplatelets post op did you ever face such situation no i haven't done a, like planned I haven't done this mm. but um it is possible like you think if you I I remember cases before when when we didn't have this intraoperative yes yes 
where you yes, have like a clock here and then you go in and go golden days i am i am talking of way back in 2000 or something maybe about 20 years back so that's the yeah. time we used to with the endovascular people they they will say that you you short up the neck i'll put the coil so that's yeah, exactly. the way we used to act. but that's a good thought, really yeah nice. uh, excellent i am really impressed particularly about the stroke it's truly impressive thing what you have shown and you try about those basilar thing it is going to be a great addition i can tell you to your technique and your hybrid operation okay thank you so thank much you. okay thank nice you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you very okay. much okay, okay. thank you Raj. from our other uh, panelists uh, dr liu anything questions from you thanks thanks raja thanks prof for a very nice interesting uh, hybrid method I, i would like to ask you uh, three short question professor uh, if you have planned a hybrid procedure uh, with 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 intravascular device going to place for example like stent or flow diverter uh, may i know what's the protocol that you use especially regarding uh, uh, loading of uh, anti platelet whether any specific region uh, regime that you use for this hybrid procedure to reduce the risk of a post operative bleeding uh, my second question professor you show the case that uh, sinus thrombosis sagittal sinus thrombosis secondary to avf and and you you call it uh, uh, do you let us start uh, anti coagulant and if so when do you start that uh, how long after the procedure that you going to start it uh, my last question professor if you encounter vasospasm just to show that uh, do you use any drugs for example like papavarin whether you use intravascular or or just uh, infiltrate over the surface what is the best technique that you find uh, from the hybrid uh, ot thank you professor yeah for the last question um yeah so i i like to in this case i showed i it's obviously rare but um so here i used verapamil but then i also put papaverin from the outside because the head was open so i did basically double treatment from inside outside um for um for the second question um help me again that was the, i'm the trying to say oh, sinus thrombosis sinus yeah that's a very good question so the patient came in and um and so neurology wanted to put the patient already on or anticoagulation and we um we didn't start it so we we just had the patient on heparin and then for the procedure we paused the heparin um but since we only did a burr hole in that case i felt pretty confident that that this will be fine um and then we we um after a few days after we also started or anticoagulation um but i i yeah so so obviously um that's 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 a consideration and then your first question um i forgot <laughs> uh, uh, first first question on a plan a hybrid when you need to use intravascular device so how do you plan the anti platelet regime thank you yeah so in that in that case i haven't any cases where we started open and then we would do a flow diverter or stand i think i would wait for that i wouldn't do it interruptively because i mean if you have to put the patient on dual antiplatelets with the stand um that's pretty challenging um usually my setup for dual antiplatelets if it's just endovascular and i'm in the procedure and decide to do it is 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 main, mainly we, we we um do an og tube and 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 load the patient with berlinta because it's a pretty fast 30 minutes um um load and it's it's much more co- convenient also with our anesthesia team and a nursing team to do that rather than iv um but um yeah so i haven't done one where it's really open procedure and then i um i had to fully anticoagulate i wouldn't do that and i would rather wait until it's closed in a few days after start loading and and do the endovascular procedure thank you thank you professor dr rahman you can ask your question um thank you uh, thank you professor for nice presentation i just uh, i'm just wondering uh, in case of large avm uh, do you embolize initially for difficult feeders then go for excision uh, do you have experience like in these cases yeah so so i'm usually embolizing and and then but not in the same procedure as open because i want to make sure that i didn't cause a complication i mean it's a nice i i always think about it too like oh that would be nice to do it in one procedure but i rather i rather want to see that the patient is doing fine and even like repeat imaging between the embolization and the surgery because my my worst nightmare would be something happens after surgery and then i don't know did i do it because of the end of vascular or because of the resection so i i i haven't done that yet but like um i had two cases recently where i was thinking about it since we have the setup where there was like a a dural feeder and i was like oh i could just quickly call this off and then resect 
in it. So there was a f fistula component. But then in the end, I mean, if you do the open surgery, you're right at that feeder and you can take that the approach. So I didn't do it. But like that, these are um, thoughts I had too. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pra Prakash or Dr. Selfie, any comments for me? Yes, Prakash. Well, excellent. Thank you very much. I mean, I have to congratulate you on how you, you've shown the hybrid procedures. So my question is actually about uh, the chronic SDH case that you've shown. So what is the algorithm that you use in US right now to uh, decide on which one of these patients will go in for middle meningeal artery embolization versus uh, the primary surgery? Yeah. So that's a very good question because we, we don't have any guidelines yet because the trials are still enrolling. So for the different trials that different inclusion criteria, they can be in combination right after surgery or in um, or instead of like best medical treatment. Um, so there are different randomization processes. And so we try usually to only enroll patients in the trials because there's no guidelines and no recommendations. But in patients like when it's a recurrent subdural hematoma or patients who, who are on dual antiplatelets who are like high risk for open surgery and require treatment, for these patients, we use them outside the trial obviously very careful to make sure. And um, we have very good experience for us. I mean, we do this, we're doing this for a couple of years now. And um, my feeling is it doesn't work in all cases, obviously, but um, in um, we see significant uh, reduction of hematoma size with embolization in these, in these cases. And especially, I think it's good in, in patients who are on oral anticoagulation or dual antiplatelets, because you can continue the medication, you embolize it, and you still see a reduction. Um, despite the fact they're still on aspirin and plavix. But um, to answer your question, there is no guideline right now, but like I'm hopeful that within the next months or year, we'll, we'll have some more, more data on this. Just one more question. Uh, when you do these procedures, uh, do you have two neurosurgeons working at the same time to do the endovascular part and the open part, or do you switch from the head side to do the angina? No, I, we'll do this all ourselves. So we have fellows um, and residents. Um, and so... So usually, um, and we have crossover between the fellows and residents to help us with open or endovascular, but it's usually the same attending. Um, for this, um, so for MMA embo, for this hybrid procedure, I usually do the embolization first because um, if you if you would do a craniotomy, for example, you, you cut the dura a little bit, obviously, and then you get rid of the MMA and you first want to infiltrate that that membrane. So um, I that's, that's at least like the order. I usually do endovascular and then open, but uh, it's the same attending. All these cases I showed you is the same attending. So either it was Dr. Shunavasan or me in these cases. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll uh, move on. Can Dr. I have Maturi, a yes, yes, Dr. Selfie. Yes. You can take one question from you. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Burkhardt. This is a very interesting presentation. I saw thank that you. in one of your slides, you were mentioning about the endoscopic uh, surgery doing in the hybrid OR. Can you explain a little bit, which is that a common uh, procedure at UPenn or only for special cases? Thank you. No, this very, very specific special cases. That was a rare case of like a trapped um, CC fistula, carotid um, cavernous fistula. And there was really no approach to this. Um, and we we noticed actually one of our residents at Baylor noticed that there's direct connection uh, to sphenoid sinus. So, um, we, we teamed up with our um, specialist for um, transphenoidal approach with Dr. Yosher, my chairman, um, and and they did the approach for us. And then we we just um, poked a needle into that in that pouch, and then uh, Dr. Khan, my partner, during that time, uh, just uh, injected onyx to the needle directly, transphenoidal, and cured the fistula by that. So it's very rare. Um, uh, concept, but um, it's it's nice to think out of, outside the box and really include, since we're so sub-specialized nowadays in neurosurgery, to really collaborate with your partners um, um, to, to do combined approaches. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Mathuri, you want to ask the last uh, question? Yes. There, there is one, one information and one comment. The comment is it is always better to have two teams, one for the endovascular and another for the surgical thing. It's my suggestion. It may be agreed upon or not. And the other thing is, uh, this is to Prakash. Say, we should be proud that uh, this uh, particulate uh, embolization of the AVM have been started in Sri Chitra 43 years back. 
by Dr. Rao, Dr. V. R. K. Rao, and Dr. George Matthews then. And at that time, I was a lecturer in Sri Chitra. So we are proud of that. Okay, thank you very much. That's what I want. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll come to the end of the first session. We're extremely grateful to Professor Jainka Bhakar for this wonderful lecture. Professor Shinchi Yoshimura has just messaged me and he said, uh, he extremely sorry because he's stuck in the operation theater right now. So Dr. Prakash, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. For today, uh, okay, I'd like to welcome Dr. Yoshi, uh, Selfie Yosiwari who is the attending at uh, the Department of Neurosurgery Universities Pajaran uh, in Bangdung and in the Department of Neurosurgery Indonesia National Brain Center in Jakarta. Dr. Oswari completed her uh, neurosurgical fellowship in skull base and neuro-oncology from the University of Toronto and then again from the hospital Diderot in Paris. And uh, she shall be talking to us about transgenoidal surgery so, uh, welcome Dr. Selfie Oswari, and uh, I hand over the uh, stage to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And firstly, I would like to thank again and again to Dr. Raja that has been very persistent in continuing this uh, very useful education that can be reached from anywhere over the world. So today I would like to talk a little bit about the endoscopic phenomenal transplant or pituitary surgery. I know that this is a very wide topic. So I just going to touch a little bit about how is it was done in the past, present and the future. Hopefully it will be very uh, useful, especially for the young neurosurgeon that are watching right now. So I would like to talk about the past, present and future. I'm just gonna go through this quite fast about how it begins. I think everyone still remember that Victor Hosley was the one that performed the first transcranial pituitary surgery and Harvey Cushing was the one that also performing his first pituitary surgery in 1910. And then Joseph Hardy introduced the microscope for the pituitary surgery and the concept of microadenoma. And then as we know, the Apuzo Coldwell uh, and then uh, fortunately early 90. Uh, the pure endoscopic transvenodal technique was performed by Jankowski in 1992. Just pure endoscopic transvenodal approach. And then in the 21st century, we were hoping that uh, we can continue to have the technological advances in 3D computer-assisted neural navigation probably. Ultrasonography can be used for endoscopic approach, interoperative MRI, ICG, the 3D model and 4K, and the ultra high definition. So in the present, how is it in this era? I think if we try to search in the PubMed, uh, I just uh, researched it again uh, earlier before the um, presentation. I saw that if we want to see, seek the um, paper, the meta-analysis paper about the endoscopic skull base, we can find even 39 meta-analyses itself. And here uh, it was shown from the 90s to the 2020, it's going uh, rapidly increasing. And I just going to take one of the paper uh, talking about the trends in endoscopic and microscopic transvenous surgery. Uh, they are using a survey between 2010 and then 2020. I think this is the Dr. Oyesiku's group, uh, which has been very persistent in endoscopic approaches. Um, so here we can see that in the 2010, the survey responses, endoscope is only 43%. Uh, percent. In the 2020, it's uh, become doubled. So uh, I think it showed that uh, the procedure become more and more popular amongst the surgeons and more surgeons are leaning towards the endoscopic procedure. And here, the preferred route for cellar visualization, we can also see that intranasal and neuronasal corridor is the, uh, the mostly chosen compared to the sublabial corridor, which is actually in our country, in some institution, they are still using the sublabial corridor, but I think more and more the younger generation uh, moving towards the endonasal corridor. And here, if we see the question about the 2D and 3D dimensional endoscope, this is shown that the 2D dimensional endoscope uh, is being uh, more preferred than the three-dimensional endoscope. This is also actually what happened when I tried the first time when the stores company trying to um, uh, 
um, explore the possibility on more popularizing the 3D. I think it's not that easy to change from 2D to 3D, but I'm not sure if there's another um, survey after this, maybe in the next two or three years, maybe this can also uh, change. And here, um, actually, even though that they say that the 3D endoscopic visualization has excellent or above average um, in the stereoscopic visualization, but the prevert is still the 2D. I think it's also because of surgeon, um, it will take time to uh, change between uh, one or two approach or one or two um, um, tools. And the last one that I want to highlight here is that do you believe the transfederal microscopic approach should continue to be thought in residency? It seems like uh, everyone still think that this is important because not in every places we have endoscope and also microscope, especially in our country, it's a developing country, not every uh, hospital will have uh, endoscope. So that's why we still need to know how to do it uh, microscopically. Um, I'll just gonna swap through this. So in the conclusion from this paper, they say that better instrumentation, uh, especially the access to lateral and superior, and also to have more vascular control. That's why I was interested in the previous presentation saying that doing it in the hybrid uh, room, uh, OR room will be uh, more comfortable. Of course, if something happened, then you can just uh, do the puncture and do the vascular control directly. And then the visualization and then the lens focusing ability. As we know, lens focusing for right now, it's still very manual. I think uh, hopefully in the coming upcoming year, they will have a um, automated lens focusing ability in all this endoscope. And the self-cleaning also, it's already been introduced. And the better bipolar probes and the importance of training in residency and fellowship. And especially the team training with other surgeons. I will talk about this later. Uh, I think there are several uh, papers uh, comparing about uh, doing this in a single surgeon or two surgeons. Uh, it's either two hands or four hands. They have pros and cons. And maybe we can talk about that uh, in a different uh, session. So this is the comparison of endoscope and microscope for the gross total resection. It said that endoscope Will give can give a higher chance of gross total removal, maybe because we have better visualization. And the trend and utility is increasing in the past decade, uh, but it's also still performed for microscope and the complications. Some study it's still um, uh, it's still shown uh, some difference. Sometimes it said that endoscopic have higher complication, but also uh, in some paper it said that it minimized the complication rate. And the surgery duration is actually relatively shortened than microscope, but also it will need a certain degree of learning curve to use fully endoscope. And the cost, it depends on the existence of complication. Here's just the, um, the paper from the US from 2010 to 2014, the cost of endoscope is significantly more expensive than microscope, but it actually depends on the existence of complication. And then the handling of apoplexy and CSF leak, uh, it said that endoscopic is more advantageous than microscope. Of course, there must be some debate out there and better view of the surrounding view. Uh, and mortality is said is fewer than microscope and then the recurrence is less, but I think uh, it still depends on the pathology itself. And uh, the prever by neurosurgeon is endoscopic surgery is now more prever. The length of stay, it stated that uh, from the paper, but it's only up until 2014 that insignificantly uh, no difference. But in other study, it's also show shorter length of stay. And then the visual discovery, uh, it say that it's just say the same compared to microscope. But however, uh, it depends on how long the pressure of the tumor exists and the duration of recovery may vary. Now, let's talk, talk a little bit about the pre-operative planning that needs to be done. Uh, first, of course, I would suggest the 3D reconstruction um, if it's possible, as we know that there are several tools that we can use for doing the 3D reconstruction. Uh, and then identification of surrounding neuromuscular structures, uh, neurovascular structures, I'm sorry, and then identification of normal gland and stalk. I know that this uh, about this one, there aren't that many 
um, surgeon talking about it. Maybe in our country, as a developing country, the hormone replacement therapy is very hard to get. So that's why uh, when I first uh, using more and more the endoscopic technique, uh, afterward, the patient needs to have close monitoring about the hormone replacement therapy. And not all the medication are available in our country. So that's why I was thinking at that time, I think I need to improve myself more to identify where the normal gland and where the stock and trying to preserve it more, especially because it will be very hard for the patient to pay out of pocket about the hormone replacement therapy after the surgery. And we also need to see about the tumor consistency, of course, from T2, and then the hormonal assessment, it's mandatory, and the multidisciplinary approach. Um, in my institution, we are having this uh, multidisciplinary approach for a pituitary patient from neurosurgeon, ENT, neurologist, endocrinologist, neuroophthalmologist. So we all try to work together to uh, make a better uh, service for the patient. For the classification, I don't think I need to repeat about this. I think everyone already um, understand. And here is the kind of tumor that usually come to our practice because uh, in our country, we have around 17,000 islands and not all of the island have neurosurgeons. So usually when the patient come, it's quite late. So that's why we have so many uh, giant cases. And this is the settings in our institution. So um, we are using side by side uh, between neurosurgeon and also the ENT. And this is the nurses and this is the intraoperative monitoring neurologist. So we monitor routinely three, four, six uh, and SSCP. Previously, we tried to monitor the visual evoke potential, but there are still some debate and the result, I, I don't think it's very common and it's not easy to interpret. So sometimes we are using the VEP or, but sometimes we also not uh, using it. So we have two screens uh, as usual, and then we have the all the navigation, all the tools that we do. So this is maybe for the young surgeon that are watching right now. If we uh, uh, split it, it's the nasal phase, the sphenoidal phase, and also the cellar phase. In the nasal phase, there are so many ways to do it. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. In the end, it depends on the preference of the surgeon itself. Some will cut the middle turbinate, some will lateralize, some will cut even the superior uh, half of the superior turbinate to make a one and a half a cavity. And then uh, another debate is about the, uh, making the uh, flap itself. Some will make a flap, some will only make a um, rescue flap, some will make a nasoceptal flap. I think it depends on the patient itself and also the surgeon preference. And then in the spinal phase, after identifying the osteum, and then we do the anterior spinodectomy, and then uh, we always use topper to make sure that there are no um, area that actually has no uh, posterior wall sphenoid anymore, and we can injure the vascular. So we usually use Doppler, and then after we sure that there are there aren't um, any vascular in the surrounding, then we will take the posterior sphenoidectomy. And then in the cellar phase, as we know, we will find the lateral ulcer, medial ulcer, and then we try to open cavernous to cavernous. So if I, tr I try to uh, simplify the surgical steps so that I hope uh, everyone can um, a little bit um, see how we are doing it in our institution. So there are several uh, options, lateralization, the inferior turbinate, and then the middle turbinate. If needed, then you do the middle turbinectomy and also the partial dissection of superior turbinate. And then uh, identification of the sphenoid ostium and then trying to make a vascularized nasoceptal flap. Uh, sometimes if needed, it's only, you can do it just to make a rescue flap and then you will you can decide it later whether you need to do the whole nasoceptal flap. And then this is also an important steps that uh, not everyone talk about, but uh, from I was being taught uh, by Dr. Gentili, he always mentioned that removing the sphenoid rostrum is very, very important. It's not because of the view itself, but it's because of the working corridor. So in this upper left, 
there are there's this paper which is a very beautiful paper uh, because we are working in a very small corridor. So actually, just a small bone like this. If you take it out like completely, then you will have more uh, working space, and we can see that you can move more of your scope, and then you can work uh, more um, freely. And then after that. You are doing the anterior sphenoidectomy, and then you are doing the posterior sphenoidectomy, uh, of course, with the Doppler uh, confirmation. And then you exposure from cavernous to cavernous. What we are doing is we like to do, I like to do the axial drilling and then take out uh, without uh, taking the carison uh, uh, bite. So it's just uh, peeling. Um, because I know that in that steps, it's very easy to get the vascular uh, being entangled with the bite. And then uh, after the cellular dura exposed, uh, using Doppler, make sure where the vascular, uh, the ICA and also the cavernous, and then we make the incision. There are several incisions that was actually being introduced. I know that there are some paper from Dr. Amano in Kosaku Amano in Japan, which is a very beautiful one. I didn't, I forgot I didn't put it here. It's, uh, it's using the mathematical modeling to count how big you can open with different incision. So it's either the X incision or the U, the open door incision. So from that paper, uh, it showed that if you are using the open door, like the uh, reverse U incision, then you will get more uh, working space. In endoscopic uh, approach, I think only one or two millimeter, it will be matters uh, because you need uh, to have more working space. And after that, you expose the tumor. And then what I'm doing, I'm using the double section technique. I don't really use the um, curette unless it's needed. And then after doing the internal decompression, and then we're using the subcapsular sub dissection. And finally, identify the normal gland. I try my best to identify the normal gland. Hopefully, I didn't cause any hormonal um, disturbance to the patient. And for the closure itself, uh, what I'm using is the inlay only overlay. So the inlay, uh, we are using the dural substitute. So we are putting it under the dura and then the only, uh, because uh, most of the time I will cut the middle turbinate. So the mucose from the middle turbinate can be used as an only. And then the overlays, of course, the nasoceptal flap vascularized. So here's the example. Of the patient, patient come with um, uh, uh, bitemporal hemianopsia. And here I'm doing the middle turbinectomy. We put uh, we we put a little bit uh, down, so it's just partial. Um, hopefully that's uh, while by doing that, then we can uh, be sure that the middle ostium that's actually um, uh, that actually where the frontal sinus being uh, uh, irrigated, it still it can still be open. Sometimes if we are doing a very uh, uh, extreme lateralization of the middle turbinate, what might happen is that uh, it will close the middle ostium and it will co cause the sinusitis in the frontal sinus. And then we make the nasoceptal flap and then uh, we make the rescue flap in the other um, side, just so that we can use the forehand techniques. And then uh, we did the posterior septectomy, and then we open the uh, anterior wall of the sphenoid, and then the mucose. I know there are also uh, several uh, papers saying that the mucose itself, it can be taken out and then you can put it back again as one of the layers. And also some paper also say that you need to take out so that you will uh, lower the risk of sinusitis. And also some papers saying that you can just lateralize the, uh, uh, the, the layer and then you can put it back afterward. And then we take out the posterior wall of the spinoid and make sure that the sphenoid rostrum is being taken out so that it's not in our instrument's way. After we are convinced that its governors to governors are being uh, exposed, the posterior dura, then we'll do the coagulation of the dura. 
and then we will open the sorry i think i missed that yes so apparently in this patient uh i think because um this patient comes from uh not from jakarta but from another city so when she comes uh she said that she has a uh, sudden worsening but not really blindness uh I think the patient has some apoplexia um, at that time, but then, yeah, because I mean, our country is very hard to travel. So that's why this patient came a little bit late. So that's why we can see that it's uh, the hemosiderin uh, coming out uh, and we can see that there are some pressure when we open the door itself. Now, what I would like to show here is actually the, of course, the double suction technique and then now, where is the normal gland? So that is what I usually try to find. So we already find that there's this uh, arachnoid already uh, in our way. So it means that uh, we already take out uh, most of this part, but we still have some left, especially in the uh, left side of the patient. So if I go back again from the, in the, I'm sorry, in the MRI here, we can see, that uh, maybe this is the normal gland because it highlights more and with the contrast. So that's why when looking at it, uh, I'm trying to find in the very bottom, but then because most of the consistency are the hemosiderin. So when it came out, then all the pressure coming out and then the normal gland um, move around a little bit. So when we see this, then we have question, is it tumor or is it normal gland? We try to dissect a little bit, try to follow whether it really enters the arachnoid where it becomes the stalk. But when we see uh, the appearance like this, it, it seems like it's the normal gland, but when we want to make sure, and maybe it will go like this as a stalk, uh, continuing the stalk, but then, we are using ICG just to make sure that this is uh, really the normal gland and not the tumor itself. Oh, I need to go back a little bit. So here, when we are injecting, we are just using the uh, first window of ICG. So when we see this, it highlights uh, fast. Uh, maybe around forty-five seconds to two minutes after the injection. Uh, and it's called the first window of ICG. So it will highlight more in the normal gland instead of the tumor. The tumor usually will highlight a later. I will talk about it later. There are some paper uh, presenting about it. And then we try to look in the other side, changing with the 30 degree scope. And we, we are sure that this is uh, the medial wall of the cavernous sinus in the right side. And we saw, we saw that there are some small tumor left here that we are trying to uh, take out. Uh, here's the Doppler, just to make sure that we are already in the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. And uh, all of this, all of this time, our intraoperative monitoring neurologist will uh, told us if we are retracting uh, too um, aggressive, because usually the third, fourth, or sixth nerve will be also um, have some uh, movement in the intraoperative monitoring. And then afterward, the closure itself, we are using the inlay uh, as the, here's the dura substitute inlay to hold. And then we are putting inside the dura that we open. And then here is the middle turbinate mucosa that we took out earlier and then we open and then we make it as a free flap. And in the end, we are using the vascularized nasoceptal flap. And also what's beautiful with this um, ICG, then you can see and make sure that the vascularized flap, flap is uh, being put nicely and it's not uh, tortured, or it's not uh, tortoise, sorry, not tortoise. And then you can see that uh, it's beautifully, um, uh, the fluorescent can beautifully be seen here. Here's the post up.
uh, next case, it's pretty much the same thing here. And then we open, take out the cellar floor, which sometimes it's already very, very thin. And then you don't need to use drill at all, but still drilling the uh, sphenoid rostrum is a must. Yeah. And then we're using the double section technique. And here is also a very nice instrument from Juan Fernandez Miranda, which is very light and uh, it's called the Miranda dissector, which you can use. Uh, it's the, the color is not silver. So as we can see here in the, in the um, screen, that the silver one will be very, um, the light, it's not good to, to work with, but the dark, this, uh, this dark instrument, uh, it's makes very comfortable. And it's very nice to do the subcapsular dissection with, uh, with this instrument. I hope that maybe um, in the next couple of years, there'll be more and more uh, instruments that can be uh, used uh, to help us to work more comfortably in the uh, endoscopic. And then this is the hormonal uh, afterward. And this is also another case, the giant case. We know that we need to have more space in this case, in the anterior sphenoidectomy. It's already very thin. So there are also some questions from other surgeons. Usually they ask, um, if it's this big, why don't you do uh, transcranial? So in my opinion, um, actually, if you are doing uh, with endoscopic uh, pr procedure and then you can take most the tumor out and the consistency is not that hard, then you can also ask the uh, anesthesiologist to do the falsafa maneuver to help to help us taking out the tumor nicely. So you don't really need to do a transcranial uh, procedure unless uh, maybe if it go uh, very lateral and then it cross the uh, ICA, then you need to open or you need to follow in the governor's sinus, which of course it will have more risk in bleeding. The closure is also the same thing. And if I'm afraid that I will cause some leak, then usually I will put the catheter just for one or two days just to make sure that everything is in the place. And this is the uh, the number from our hospital up until the October 2022. Most of our patient is adenoma hypothesis, uh, pituitary adenoma, and the other is the meningioma and also craniopharyngioma, the one that we're doing the transcranial procedure and some clival cordomas too. Up until now, we have 164. But this is the interesting part. Where do we go from here? So uh, I often use this slide because I think this is very interesting. Dr. Gentili uh, present this uh, mm -hmm. about the how uh, an approach or a tools being seen in the surgical field. So usually in the very beginning, uh, it will give encouraging reports. And then we will have more and more protective data collection and sharing uh, as we've seen in the first uh, couple of slides where the number of publication increasing rapidly. And then uh, the complication and discussion management will start there because so many people want to do it. And, uh, and then so many people want to share uh, how they are doing it. And also we have more and more thorough discussion about the complication and how to uh, pro, uh, how to prevent it. And then afterward, we can have refinement of the indication. So after that, we will know uh, wh where should we stop or where should we um, expand uh, using this approach. And then it will become the standard of treatment, of course. And this is very interesting. So maybe the future improvement uh, is for the visualization and then also the robotic navigation the use of intraoperative MRI and the closure technique, the one that's reducing the CSF leakage and the normal gland preservation 
especially for me, and I also understand all the uh, developing countries will agree about this. We need to reduce the use of hormone replacement therapy because it's not very easy to get and the patient need to pay out of pocket. So we want to reserve more and more to have uh, our patient less complication about the hormone replacement. And then uh, I also read uh, recently about the olfactory preservation. I think some group already uh, uh, mentioned about using the olfactometry, so trying to measure the olfaction function afterward. And I hope that in the next uh, couple of months or years, we can see uh, which technique uh, will uh, preserve the olfactory more uh, with objectively being measured uh, the olfactometry and also the nasal preservation. So here's a little bit the 3D endoscope. I know in some places they already use it. In our institution, we only try, we try to uh, ask the management for another 3D endoscope, but I don't know whether we will get it next year or upcoming years, but we already try and we really like it. It's not easy, as I mentioned before in the previous paper, Dr. Onelson Oyesiko paper, that it's not easy to change from the true 2D to 3D. But uh, if we know in the early period uh, of endoscope, uh, the group that say uh, microscope is more convenient in, in this approach is because they say that endoscope is only 3D and does not have the stereoscopic um, view. While if we are using the 3D endoscope, then I thought that then that criticism can be um, avoided. And we know that some uh, some tumors, maybe not all the tumors, we can use the 3D printing so that we know uh, where the neurovascular surrounding structures uh, beforehand. And then of course the 4K technology, it's also very beautiful. So even though it's a 2D, but it's a 4K enhanced and I know that uh, stores already have it uh, and it will be very useful in visualization. Um, and then comparing the 2D and 3D, uh, in 3D, we can also just use the, um, the eyeglasses. And then we can see uh, from two uh, pictures, combine two ones so that we, we will have more stereoscopic feelings. This is the comparison of the 2D, 3D, and the 4K for the image quality. So uh, lack of depth perception and set of vision, of course. But then the 4K, it provides more detailed information on surgical anatomy and higher definition on the pathology. And then for the 3D, it provides an intuitive uh, depth perception and also the stereoscopic vision. And there are no, of course, no significant difference in the hospital uh, stay, but the, the, the group that say the 2D is um, more comfortable, maybe the diameter is smaller. And then... Uh, could be advantages due to wider field of view. So we can see wider if we need the wide um, angle. But if we want to go more zoom, then I think the 3D version is, is even better so that you can have the stereoscopic and very specific area. Okay, next, I would like to talk a little bit about the ICG. So as we know, in the last couple of years, it's already being proposed to use to identify the normal gland. So uh, it's a common uh, fluorescence that was being used and the, and the intraoperatively it's injected in the body interferentially form of uh, like a normal ICG for microscope. And then you give 10 cc of normal saline as a bolus. And then we can see uh, the, we can measure in the 45 seconds up until two minutes where the signal going up, and then after that, it will slowly decrease over time. So for the benefit, it's a real-time visualization and differences in tissue vascularization. Uh, and it's enabled to distinguish between a normal pituitary gland and pituitary adenoma, which leads to obtain complete tumor resection and also to preserve, uh, attempt to preserve endocrine function and no adverse reaction. Uh, but the limitation is the visualization is affected by the hemostasis of the operative field and the volume of tumor mass. Uh, this is some paper saying that uh, maybe 5-ALA can also be used, but there are also um, some debate that 
up until now in our country, five ala is still very expensive. So we are not really using the five ala, but the fluorescence, it's very easy to get. So I think it will be more useful uh, in everywhere. And Dr. Amano also presented about this uh, in the Nature 2019 about the visualization of the normal gland with the uh, ICG injection. Here, it can also be helpful in the functioning so that you know, and then you know, you know where the normal glands are, and then you can decide precisely how much you want to take uh, the gland out, the hypophysectomy. And here's the um, application of uh, ICG, uh, the measurement of time. So here we can see for the pituitary adenoma, for the tumor itself, it the green one. So it will be going up uh, very, very slowly, the uptake of the fluorescence to the tumor cells, and it will be maximized at six uh, minutes. Whereas at the normal gland, it will uptake directly in the uh, uh, after two minutes and going up uh, directly. So that that's why we can, in this uh, period between one and five, we can check uh, where the normal glands are and where the tumors are. And we can also use this, of course, not only for pituitary adenoma, but we can also use it for other tumors like craniopharyngioma to see where the vascular uh, structures surrounding. I think, uh, this is so. This is a bit different from the previous um, ICG, where in this uh, settings, it's you don't need to work in a very dark. Um, light where it will go enhanced so that you can see the gland itself continuously while working. This is also the same so that you can identify where the normal glands are and you can work while knowing uh, which one to preserve, which one to uh, take out uh, more objectively. I think I'm just going to skip this one. It will be just the same. And also, um, this is for craniopharyngioma, where, of course, this can be very helpful to see where the A1 bilateral, A com, and then A2. So, in the conclusion, the endoscopic endonasal tapenodal pituitary surgery, from the very first time being invented and implemented, was already a breakthrough in medical world. It does not stop evolving and developing to bring the less complication, better outcome, and quality of life. In the end, it's not the disease we treated, but the patients. Uh, by this, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. Here is our hospital, the Indonesian National Brain Center Hospital. We are the referral center for brain and spine cases in Indonesia, which we know it consists of seven, more than 70,000 islands. And here in the hospital, we have a dedicated multidisciplinary team. And we also have uh, started the Indonesian Military Community Foundation trying to uh, make, the, uh, make the people aware about uh, these diseases because it's not really common to check hormonal or to ask for the patient to have a hormonal therapy. I think this is a problem um, solely in the developing country where I think in the developed country, it's very easy, you can just check everything, but here we need to have adjustment where to, when to check or uh, when we don't need to check. And I would like to thank, of course, from Dr. Gentili and all the team, uh, the one that has already taught me uh, a lot about this. And this is my partner, my ENT partner, Dr. Krishna. We're working together and thankfully, uh, we are still continue doing it together up until now. And I also would like to invite everyone, uh, Dr. Raja, if you don't mind, I would like to talk a little bit about this as no. So we will have our scientific uh, Asian Society for Neuro-Oncology meeting uh, in October. And I would like to give a little bit teaser. And I really hope that uh, everyone here would like to come and it's in Bali. It will be in a very nice, warm place. And uh, 
in this uh, meeting, we will have multidisciplinary um, um, specialty. So we also will have several um, working, uh, sorry, work, uh, workshop. And hopefully we can all meet there and discuss more about how we can proceed with neuro-oncology. Thank you very much, Dr. Raja. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Selfie. Prakash? Also, Dr. Selfie, congratulations for a wonderful talk. I mean, it was extremely educative. So uh, I had a couple of questions. The first was regarding the use of lumbadrains. So do you use lumbadrains routinely for your uh, pituitary cases, or do you use them only in selected cases? Mm. Thank you. So um, I don't use it routinely. I know that in Pittsburgh, they have the RCT previously about when to use the uh, lumbar drain. So I only use it for the high flow possible leak. For example, for clival chordoma, yes, I use it, but I don't uh, really open it directly, but I have it in place. If the patient has some leak, then I will open it. But for high flow only, and even for anterior fossa, I don't use any lumbar drain. I think with vascular flap, it's it's very helpful. The vascular the vascular flap is the one that really makes it doesn't leak. And how, after surgery, uh, what sort of ENT follow up do you give for these patients who have had nasal flaps and you know may have crusting and all those problems? Mm. So afterward, we will give the patient the nasal irrigation, and then after one week, uh, the patient will come to my ENT and will have the bedside uh, endoscopic um, examination. And then if my ENT can take out some of the crusting, then it will be nice. And usually the patient will feel some relief after that. A couple of those cases that you showed, you know, very big tumor, very challenging tumor. Yeah. And uh, when you see them uh, extending to either direction, when do you decide uh, that you want to do a craniotomy? And when you decide for a craniotomy, how do you do it? I mean, how do you plan to do it? Do you do the craniotomy first and then the transphenoidal procedure? Or would mm -hmm. you do the transphenoidal procedure first and do the craniotomy? Okay. I think this is a very interesting question. I think in our last webinar meeting with uh, Dr. Gardner uh, in the Indonesia National uh, Brain Center Zoom in our uh, education at that time during the pandemic. So I also have the same, same question, but the actual uh, answer is, the complication after the big removal of um, uh, pituit giant pituitary adenoma that's not removed completely is usually the apoplexy, the bleeding. And people don't actually die from it. Like uh, it doesn't cause, cause morbidity or mortality uh, directly. So what I usually do, I will take out first from the endonasal procedure and then if it goes uh, very uh, lateral, then I already talked to the patient, uh, the possibility on the second surgery. And if I had the complication of uh, bleeding afterward, then I will already talk to the patient that I will put the EVD first and then possibly continue with the transcranial approach. But it's not actually stopping you on uh, choosing the first uh, approach from endonasal. Because it can be sometimes very difficult to, you know, decide when you have a very large component lateral to the IC in the dorsal fissure, and you have a similar large component in the center, uh, then either of those cases can result in bleeds, you know, either medially or laterally. So timing those procedures can be very difficult. Uh, so one last question, especially because, you know, a lot of this will be watched by a lot of the young uh, neurosurgeons who are, you know, learning their way in endoscopy. How would you suggest, how would you suggest uh, a young neurosurgeon who is interested in uh, endoscopic and nasal surgery with pituitary start his journey? How would you advise him to, you know, proceed in terms of neurosurgical training, in terms of fellowships, in terms of cadaver workshops? This is also a very nice question. So in the very beginning, I also was being taught endoscopic 
procedure during my residency. I was lucky in Universitas Pajajaran, we are also using endoscopic uh, approach for pituitarinoma most of the time. But at that time, uh, I think what we are doing is very, um, it's not really extensive. And afterward, when I do the fellowship, a dedicated fellowship, I think it really helps. So it's not only the conscious learning that you will get, but you will have the subconscious learning so that you know the decision making and everything. So I would suggest for the young neurosurgeon that's really interested in this to take some time, maybe several months or even a year to really learn all the, it's not only do it in the cadaver because you need to know how to prevent the complication. You need to know the data that's being shared uh, in the paper. You need to know if you choose uh, something over other things, like for example, the lumbar drain, then you know the, the reason and you already analyze it together with someone that's already very experienced and mentorship is very helpful. Thank you so much. I think uh, this was a wonderful uh, talk from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prakash and Dr. Selfie for this wonderful session. I understand there are uh, no further questions from the audiences. Dr. Liu, would you like to ask something? Yeah, probably a fast question. Uh, uh, if if you, you have a paracellar extension and you plan to go in transcranial, would you at any point of time use a cranial uh, endoscope to see around the corner since you are a person who likes to use endoscope? Would that become a part of your uh, routine? My second question is, uh, there, there are also instances that when you have uh, early CSF leakage, some, some uh, surgeon will propose to early re-exploration uh, rather than conservative such as a rest in bed, a dimox or antibiotic or lumbar drain per se. So which one would you pre prefer to go in, re-explore or, or try to be conservative early? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, for the first question, yeah, using the transcranial, uh, using endoscope in transcranial as, a, as, a, as an adjunct, it's very interesting. And sometimes we're using it, but sometimes because it's taking a lot of time, uh, to be honest, uh, we don't really use it. But if we know that we need to have it, uh, then we will try to prepare it. But to be honest, I'm not using it very commonly, but it's a very nice point that you uh, share here. And for the second question, um, in my practice, I will be more conservative because as we know this, as if we are using all this inlay only overlay technique, I think for the last two years, I have never had any um, re-exploration because of the CSF leak. Uh, and also, of course, uh, by choosing, if I know that it will cause a high flow leak, then I will uh, use uh, the lumbar drain directly, but I will not open it uh, after, right after surgery, only if I need it. And I, I believe that uh, the rest in bed and also Diamox is very helpful. So I don't really do the re-exploration uh, very aggressively. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we can come to the closing part of this webinar. So I'll close this officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yuko Kaito. I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Jan Kalbarkhad and Dr. Selfie Oswari, as well as Chair, Professor Prakash Nair. And I understand Professor Yoshimura Kunin joined us because of an emergency surgery. So I thank everybody for supporting the ACNS webinars and sincere gratitude to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And also to special thanks to my co-host Liu Kun Seng for joining me today. So until we all uh, meet tomorrow online at uh, 7 p.m. Japan time, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining.